Best Book Bits podcast brings you MJ DeMarco, semi-retired entrepreneur, the revolutionary get rich slow anti-guru, author of the best-selling books, Millionaire Fastlane, Crack the Code to Wealth, and Live Rich for a Lifetime. The book Unscripted, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Entrepreneurship, and The Great Rat Race Escape, from Wage Slavery to wealth, how to start a purpose-driven business and win financial freedom for a lifetime. MJ, thanks for being on the show. Hey, hey, Michael, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Now, take us back to living with your mother and mopping floors, dreaming of a life free from the nine to five and a boss. When was this? Oh, that was uh, many years ago um, when, uh, you know, I grew up in a middle-class household, lower middle-class household where you know, getting food on the table was always an issue. Um, and I really aspired uh, for a life of affluence, of um, wealth. And uh, real young, uh, I gave up on that idea because I figured in order to get rich, um, get rich and do it young, you had to be an athlete, you know, a professional footballer or um a celebrity or, or, or something like that. And I had no interest in that. I wasn't, wasn't good with athletics and whatnot. And one day uh, in my neighborhood, there was a Lamborghini Countach. I think I was 13, 14 years old. And I was absolutely mesmerized by this car uh, back then. It was in the Cannonball Run, a big movie back then. It was a spaceship looking car and I absolutely loved it. So when I saw it in the per- just in, in the flesh, I was absolutely amazed by it. And then I saw um, the person who was driving it was a young man. And that threw me for a loop because I figured, uh, you know, you would have to be an older person to be driving a six-figure car. Uh, And at that point, I decided I was going to go up to him and ask him what he did for a living. And uh, interestingly, uh, if you ever owned a Lamborghini, I've owned several, that is a very frequent occurrence. uh, People coming up to you, asking you what you do. And, uh, and here I did it back then, 30 some plus years ago. And he, uh, he said he was an entrepreneur and that set me on a path to become an entrepreneur um, very early in life. And looking back at that, it was a very key distinction. Um, it was a belief shift for me that, hey, you know what? If you want to pursue this career as an entrepreneur and a business owner, you can uh, acquire wealth pretty quickly. Um, So it was a belief shift for me back then because to be honest with you, I didn't have much faith um, that I could do it because I didn't want to be the athlete. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't shoot hoops or anything. And I certainly didn't like the standard advice, which was you had to go get a job for 50 years, save all your money, you know, wait for stock market wealth to cap in over 40 or 50 years. That certainly didn't appeal to me. So that that little, probably 15-minute little uh, event absolutely changed my life, and I've been an entrepreneur ever since. Um, Obviously, I failed a bunch on the way, but eventually I found my way and was able to escape what what I call the script, uh, which is a default way of living that everyone is told to live by without question. And uh, it pretty much leads to a state of mediocrity for the rest of your life. And that was something I absolutely did not want to endure. I was able to uh, semi-retire in my middle, middle, mid-30s. And as I told you on the pre-show, I I feel like I haven't worked in 25 years. And it's just been a fantastic, um, you know, unfortunately, if I die tomorrow, I would have no regrets um, so I'm very, I'm very happy. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. And some of the notes I got from that early age and with that Lamborghini story, I know you're getting ice cream and you've seen the car went over to him and you, and you unpack it well in the book, but just changing that belief really, really early on as well. And then you decided, you know, I'm going to give up on the idea of getting rich slow, but what you did was you took action. So you started studying young millionaires who weren't famous or who weren't physically talented as you call them fameless wealth. Who were some of the people you studied and what were the sort of early sort of things that you learned from an early age when you're studying these people? Yeah. There were so many. Um, I I couldn't give you any names because I was constantly researching them. There was um, magazines I would look at because back then there was no internet. Um, It wasn't something I could just research. So I was always paying attention to the stories uh, in the magazines. Um, There was a show, I don't know if it was 
I don't know if it was in Australia or not, but there was a show here in, in the States called The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And they, it was like a cribs for the day. And they would go into these big houses and they would show off all these cars. And I noticed in that that they always were athletes, they were always celebrities, or they were always entrepreneurs. And they were young, um, you know, considering, considering uh, you know, 30, 35 or whatever, depending on what you are, but they were young. And that's, that's very much confirmed um, that I was going to pursue this for the rest of my life. This was not going to be a career. This was going to be a lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're right about college as sort of a five-year prenatal corporate brainwashing with graduation as the overrated climax. What was your experience like with, uh, with college? Was I, I did pretty well in college. Um, I graduated with a degree in finance and a degree in marketing. However, um, when graduation came, uh, all my friends and peers were getting jobs and they were interviewing and they couldn't understand why I wasn't doing that. And I said, well, I want to start a business. So I kind of was looked down upon like as some kind of strange person that didn't want to get a job. And I remember talking to a, a friend of mine, um, the, the uh, fellow I graduated with at the time, and he was bragging about how I got a, uh, I got a job as an accountant with a big five accounting firm. And I'm going to be making six figures, you know, in a, in a matter of a few years. And I said, oh, that's great. Well, maybe one day I'm going to hire you. Um, and it's funny now because looking back, I can guarantee you that that guy is still working nine to five, still putting money into the stock market, still waiting for a retirement at 60 or 65 and waiting for his three week, four week vacation every year. Um, but at college, um, didn't really teach me a lot about fi uh, business, um, about growing a business. Everything I learned to grow a business happened after college, which is interesting. Um, the saying I say is education does not end at graduation. It begins. Uh, so that's one of the key elements of somebody who wants to uh, create a fast lane entrepreneurial venture is you never you never stop learning. It's just just constant. Even to this day, at my age, uh, I'm in my fifties now. Um, it just never ends. And if you're not open minded about learning, I, the, the amount of people that don't read books is just it's sad. Um, and I'm sure your audience is well ahead of that curve because they're reading books. And so that right there gives them a very distinct advantage over anybody else uh, in society. Yeah, one of the notes I got from that, education begins after school and people think education stops. Uh, and that's the problem with people not learning and having that people finish school and have a fixed mindset and think that's all I'm ever going to know, where really the growth mindset is, well, I've got so much more to learn. Can you take us back to sort of escaping Phoenix with 900 bucks, no job, no friends, no family? What did you get up to and how did you kick off your entrepreneurial journey? Well, that's you're going back quite a bit here. Um... It was, I was, I believe I was seasonally depressed. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that's uh, when you don't, there's not a lot of sun, it's cloudy, it's damp, it's dreary. So whenever it wasn't, whenever it was cloudy, which in Chicago is quite often, even in the summer and springtime, it was raining a lot, I would, I would get depressed and I just would have no motivation to pursue my goals. Um, back then, again, it was one of my goals to own a Lamborghini. Um, and a convertible, which is not a practical car in Chicago um, because it's the weather is always usually inclement and it's cold. So I uh, circled um, five or six cities around the country and I said, hey, if, if I could move anywhere in this country, where would I go? So I circled a bunch of cities and uh, visited all of them and decided uh, that I would one day move to Phoenix. And I did so about a year later after I made that decision, packed everything I went. I think I, I came $900. I went down there. I had a very small studio apartment. Um, I had the rent paid for maybe a month and a half. So I had a, a month and a half, two month runway. And, you know, I was willing to get a job. Um, but it was kind of an all in approach for me. But as soon as I hit Phoenix and that sun, which is 300 days of sun hit me, uh, I was like 
go, 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 go. And I have actually never had to get a job because I was able to uh, bootstrap my business uh, from nothing. I started freelancing in the beginning and built a business service and everything else from there is, is history. Um, it was one of the biggest, uh, best decisions I ever made in my life. Um, you know, because nothing, moving somewhere that resonates with your personality and your soul and, and how you want to live. A lot of people have a fear as if, oh, we can't do that. They have these sacred cows, you know, oh, we can't move because um, Joey lives here. Or I've been friends with Bill for, you know, six years. You know, you have to do what's best for your life. And human beings are everywhere. You can find new friends. You can always fly back to visit family. Um, so, I, and a lot of people, I, I run a business forum, very active business forum, and I, a lot of people have this fear of doing something when the worst case scenario is what you can move back. Um, but I have never seen anybody who said, Hey, I wanted to move somewhere totally different, get out of my city, especially if you have baggage in your particular city, a fresh start is always wonderful. Um, so my life changed with that. Another, again, another small decision, um, well, it was kind of big, but it was, it was a decision that was made in an instant that absolutely changed my life. Yeah, I can resonate with a lot of that as well. And uh, yeah, reading your book, you go into the early stages. So the reason I want to pack the early stages is about what happened next to there as well. We've got a similar background. I myself was a limo driver dropping people and picking people up from the airport and having many hours of downtime. And that's where I started my obsession with reading books and you know gaining knowledge and that passion of sharing that knowledge with the world as well. You talk about your early sort of uh, jobs as well. You were very early in the lead generation business back in the late 90s and you built a, a great website as well. Can you touch on that and how that sort of started this idea of, hang on a sec, I've built an asset that I'm getting paid monthly. And how did that unfold with that lead generation and that early websites that you built? Sure. Um, well, I actually, when I first got to Phoenix, I um, became a freelancer uh, and I built websites. And this is very good. If, if, if there's people in your audience who um, have no capital, um, it's a great way to start to ramp up um, your capital acquisition. Uh, so instead of making, you know, I don't know, $15 an hour at some job uh, pouring coffee, you start making $80 an hour, or $100 an hour freelancing. So you work less and you make more. So I, I taught myself how to design websites. Um, and you know, it's interesting, 20, I don't know how many years later, that is still a great way to get started. Uh, if you just go on the web and you see like a lot of local businesses that just have terrible websites, they're not compliant with technology, they don't have online scheduling yet. Uh, so it's, it's still a great way um, to generate capital and ramp up the kind of uh, money you're making from like, you know, the $20 an hour to $100 an hour. So that's what I started doing. And as I did that, I started learning different skills, code skills, programming skills, started building my business system. And I originally started it off as a connection directory where, you know, if you're traveling uh, across the country and you need to be picked up at the airport as a way to find somebody that could do that for you. This is way before Uber. Um, and then, um, you know, I had a friend over one day and, and he was just amazed that there was someone using the service every minute. You know, the emails were just one after another. And he said, you should turn that into, turn those emails into money somehow. And uh, that's when I uh, turned it to a lead generation service where I would connect travelers with the providers who could fill them. And I would charge a, uh, a per lead basis. And all those providers, I would say, hey, you know, join my service. You can do it for free. You know, and if I, if I can't deliver you new clientele, new customers, you don't pay me a dime. So from that point on, everything just went gangbusters, uh, just exploded and, um, you know, started growing. I ended up selling that company a couple of years later. Uh, and then um, I ended up buying it back because this was during the dot-com uh, cr uh, crash or the dot-com uh, bust that happened so many years ago. I ended up buying that company back because they were going to go bankrupt. They were going to they were going to destroy the company. And I said, hey, I'll buy it back from you pennies on the dollar. And then I ran it again for another five years, made another several million dollars from it, and then ended up selling it again. Um, so I owned that company for a good eight, nine, 10 years. I don't even know what it is. It's been so long ago, but company was able to make me tens of millions of dollars over, 
you know, the course of, you know, nine, 10 years. Um, and it was good because uh, I looked at it, you know, when I was about to sell it, um, the landscape was changing. Again, this was before Uber, but Uber was just about to get into the business. And I was like, you know, I really don't want to be hiring four more people, tech people and, and doing all that minutia. Um, so that was a good time for me to sell it because the people I sold it to had, had ideas like that. Um, for me, I wanted to start a, a publishing company. I wanted to focus on writing. I loved to write. And at that time, hey, I decided, I knew I would never needed to work another day in my life. And I said, hey, I'm going to start a publishing company. I'm going to uh, write books about um, how people can mimic, not, you know, mimic exactly what I did, but the basic structure of a fast lane business, which allows anyone to start a business that generates asymmetric returns. And asymmetric returns is... Uh, and I started my company with a few, you know, hundred dollars and it's generated tens of millions of dollars. That's asymmetric returns, cryptocurrency. People love cryptocurrency and you never know. Why do they love cryptocurrency? Because the average Joe can experience or they have experienced. I don't know if it's possible any longer, but they did experience asymmetric returns. Hey, I bought Bitcoin at 20 cents and now it's worth $42,000. That's asymmetric returns. The problem with crypto is you don't control it. Um, a business can do the same thing for you, and you control that. And uh, when you follow a certain number of principles, I call it the sense framework, you elevate your probabilities for achieving uh, a kind of outcome like that and do so within uh, less than 10 years, seven years, five years, a short period of time. Um, and the, I mean, I have a... Behind my computer, you can't see it. I have a wall of, you know, testimonials from people who have followed the book and just been like, hey, I can't believe it. My life has changed. I had a guy tell me his company's worth a billion dollars. Um, you know, it's just a, a, a great way to see that your knowledge is being applied and changing people's lives. It's awesome. And we're going to jump into the millionaire fast lane. You talk about just with the, the website business, you ended up selling it for 1.2, you bought it back for 250,000, then you sold it for millions and millions. And at one stage, you were sort of talking about making 200 grand uh, every month and it was just ticking on by. So I can understand why you wrote the book. But yeah, in 2007, you retired. And during your hiatus, you wrote The Millionaire Fast Lane, which took four years to write instead of three months, as you thought. Yeah, give us a snapshot. What What is what is sort of the, the book about? We're going to get into some observations and, and what the different financial roads are. But in your words, yeah, what, what's the book about? Uh, again, yeah, The Millionaire Fast Lane is. Uh, I wrote it in 2007. Um, it was about three years it took me to write, not four. Um, but it was everything that I wish I knew when I was 20 is in that book. And there's nothing, you know, I don't, there's no upsell in there. I don't sell coaching seminars. I don't sell um, workshops, you know, for $5,000. I have no upsell whatsoever. Everything that you need to know is in that book or any other one of my books because I don't hide anything. There's a complete framework in there and how you can increase your probability uh, for generating a business that not only just pays your bills, but it changes your life. Because uh, entrepreneurship is hard enough. And the worst thing to do is start a business and all it does is pay your bills and, and you essentially created yourself a job. That's not why you want to get into business. You want to get into business is to change your customers' lives and simultaneously change your life. So the foundation of my philosophy, which is in every single book I've written, is the sense framework, um, which is five different, um, I guess, litmus tests or strategies that you want your business to follow or comply that's going to increase the probabilities that you can have an asymmetric outcome with your business. Meaning, hey, I started this business with $5,000 and now it's worth $20 million. That's what we're, that's the objective of the Millionaire Fast Lane. Millionaire Fast Lane is not about saving money, putting it into the stock market and waiting and living a life of, well, I can't eat out, I can't drive the car I want, I can't live where I want, I can't do any of this stuff I want to do because one day I'm going to retire rich. Um, I call that the live poor, die rich model. And I'm all 
about getting away from that. And I realize some people want to do that, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. But there's a certain sub subsegment of people that simply want more out of life. They want you know, to drive what they want to drive. They want to live where they want to live. If they want to go to the, uh, the sushi restaurant five days a week, they can because they can afford it. They're not living this miserly existence. So the Millionaire Fast Lane describes how you can have that happen uh, in a short period of time. You know, whereas everyone else is saying, oh, just wait 30, 40, 50 years. I'm saying, no, you can do it in three, five, seven, or 10 years. And that's the essence of the book. That's the essence of of my work yeah and it all does come down to belief system and believing that you can do it as well um i'll just recap on sort of the three financial roads that you talk about in the book and then if you want to expand on them you can uh you talk about the sidewalk which is living well today at the expense of having more security tomorrow the sidewalk as destination is being poor next you talk about the slow lane which is sacrificing today so that you can be better off in the future uh the opposite of the sidewalk the slow lanes destination is mediocrity and then you talk about the fast lane, which is working hard today on something that people value so you can become wealthy in the next sort of five, seven, or 10 years as well. Is that sort of a good recap on the three financial roads? So the sidewalk, um, I think every, everyone starts on the sidewalk. Uh, that's when you just, you know, everything you earn, you spend. You don't say that, you don't, excuse me, you don't plan for the future. And it's really interesting because you can be wealthy and be on the sidewalk. Uh, this is when you have professional athletes who make millions and millions of dollars and then they go retire and then they're bankrupt three or four years later. That's someone that lives on the sidewalk. There's no money management. The slow lane is uh, what's very popular today because the stock market has hyperinflated. So people um, in the slow lane are told to save every dollar they earn live miserly, do, you know, live frugal, put all those savings into the stock market, namely indexed funds, wait 20, 30, 40 years, and then one day you're going to be rich. And if you're really a good investor and a good saver, meaning you don't buy anything, then you can maybe do it in 20 years. And, and at which point you can retire and live the same mediocre existence that you just lived for the last 20 years, sacrificing your youth for that type of existence. That's the slow lane. That's very popular nowadays. It's popularized into a term called fire today. Um, that's very popular today. And, you know, with good reason, because the stock market has been, at least here in the States, has been on a 12, 13, 14 year bull run. Uh, so there's every reason why it should be popular. But a lot, what a lot of people don't uh, understand is um, inflation. Uh, a lot of that wealth that has been created in the stock market is mostly inflation, which is underreported. And uh, the, the governments do not want to be honest with us about, you know, the, the value of our money. So they say it's 4% when in reality, it's probably about 12 or 14%. So um, that's the slow lane. Um, and it's, it's the, the crux of the slow lane is two variables, which is how fast can you save money and how much time do you have to be patient and also how much return are you going to get from the markets? 8%, 10%. And uh, again, that's not asymmetric returns. Asymmetric returns is 800%, 8,000%, 80,000%. That's asymmetric returns. And that's the essence of a fast lane. You use a fast lane business strategy to attain those asymmetric returns. And then when you have a lot of capital, 10, $20 million, when all of a sudden the stock market, you know, a measly three or four or 5% will generate you thousands and thousands of dollars every month and you're not dependent on it. So a good example, I always say, hey, you know, if the stock market dropped tomorrow 50% and stayed there for 10 years, it's not going to change my life one difference. But if you are reliant on that, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have to, you know, get another job. You're going to have to, you know, tweak your, tweak your plan. And it's just, um, it's very risky, in my opinion, a very risky strategy. Such a difference, fast lane versus slow lane mentality as well. And some of the notes I got from the book as well, and I'll just go over it. You talk about fast lane as view debt as a useful tool for getting, uh, for growing their systems, time as their most important asset and making something of value as their primary means of wealth accumulation in, in contrast to slow laners 
view passive investing as a means to getting rich. You also talk about in terms of building wealth, the goal is not to do the heavy lifting, but to create a system that does it for you. I, I think so many employees in businesses are these slow lane mentality where they're building someone else's system, but the business owner owns the system. They only own a system. They don't need to work in the system. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and just that just that mindset of, hey, instead of being the employee, how about owning the business system? That's that's really where the money is. The objective of the fast lane is to create a business system that works for you while you're not working. And uh, this is how you separate yourself from that age-old equation. If if I'm not working, I'm not making money. I have, uh, here in the States, there's a term called on the clock, which means you're making money. You punch in, you're on the clock, you work for eight hours, you punch out, you're off the clock. I've been on the clock since 1998. I've been on the clock, meaning I have been making money 1990, from 1998 till today, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's a business system because you've, you, instead of focusing on how can I ramp up how much people are willing to pay me, well, I don't want to make $20 an hour. I want to start making 50. Forget about that. Focus on a business system that's going to work for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this is covered in my other books. You do that through a specialized unit. Specialized units stand on their own. For instance, this podcast that you're doing right now, you're spending an hour here doing it. You'll maybe spend another 20 minutes editing or whatever. But once you launch that podcast into your ecosystem, it's going to exist for years. And who knows? I, I don't know if you're selling any products or you have a, a system or something. Someone may read that, to, uh, listen to it two years from now and buy whatever you're offering. That's legacy value. That's a system that you're creating. So you want to invest your time into something that's not only going to pay you money, but in the future is also going to pay you free time. And that's what's accomplished with the business system. Now, people confuse that with the specialized unit. For example, I don't have one here, but my book, that's a specialized unit. I can die tomorrow. Hope I don't. But if I die tomorrow, that book is still going to exist and it's still going to make money. It will make money for my estate. That is a specialized unit. But the thing is, people don't understand there's a business system behind that. I have a forum. There's 70,000 users at that forum. You know, hundreds of, I don't know, thousands of people, thousands of people visit it daily. Um, my YouTube channel, I have 50,000 subscribers. That's, a, that's part of the system. Um, all my uh, publishers, I publishers um, around the world, I have over 25 licenses that are all over the, over the world. Those are business systems. So people confuse the specialized unit with the, with the business system. They focus on the specialized unit, which is important, but then they neglect the business system. A good example of this is self-publishing itself. I'm a self-publisher. I own a, I'm the CEO of a, a small publishing company, but People say, oh, I'm going to get into that. So they, they, they create a book. They spend two days writing a book and they throw it up on Amazon. And guess what? They make nothing. Nothing happens. And as it should, nothing happens because you have no business system. You haven't created a platform or a brand or something that is going to be beyond the unit, the specialized unit. And so everything, there's, it's kind of a yin and yang. You have the specialized unit and then you have the business system. This is how you get divorced from time. This is when you wake up in the morning and you look and say, oh my God, I already made a thousand dollars today. And I just woke up. As, as you know, Warren Buffett said, unless you can find a way uh, to make money while you're sleeping, you're never gonna get rich. And the fast lane business system is all about that eventually separating yourself from that means of having to work in order to earn income. Get yourself on the clock and never, ever go off it again. Yeah, thanks for unpacking that. And yeah, it makes so much sense and just segues into my next question, which I made some notes, which, you know, you can make two types of choices and those choices is what to think and, and what to do. Then the first step to making better choices is to work on how you think and perceive things. So it all starts from your perception and how you think. And that would dictate your actions you decide to take. I actually myself spend a lot of time journaling, reflecting, thinking about, hang on a second, what is what is my next action? 
Like, what is the most productive thing that I can do today to invest in the future so when that day comes around six months, one year, three years, five years, that I can say, you know what, I'm glad I made those actions today because what I'm chasing, and I'll get into it, I'm chasing time, not wealth. And so, for example, if you want to build wealth, you first have to believe that you can do and that if you don't need to wait until you retire to be a millionaire and so on. But yeah, it's basically another just quick segue that goes into it, think gratification. Can you talk about why a lot of people, especially in the slow lane, are just wrapped up in instant gratification and this parasitic debt, you know, buying the car, buying the house and paying it off over 30 years and just keeping them on that rat race as well. Can you just jam on that a little bit with parasitic debt? Parasitic debt is, is any kind of debt that traps you to a job you hate or traps you to an existence you hate. There's nothing wrong with owning a six-figure car or uh, owning a, you know, a huge house. Um, I do both, but they don't, doesn't tie me to any particular action that I hate. So parasitic debt is actually more suitable to the sidewalk. Um, the slow laners usually attack debt um, by, you know, not, not engaging in consumer activities. They drive an older car, they, they cancel the subs ca uh, cable subscription, um, parasitic debt is more suitable to the sidewalk is people want to look a particular image. Oh, I own a BMW. Yeah, but you go to work every damn day in, in a job you absolutely hate. And what happens is that, and that keeps them to that job, that keeps them tied to that, and it, lo it decreases their choices, their options. Like, well, I want to start a business. Well, you can't start a business because you have a BMW payment and you have a house that you can't afford, and now you have to go to the go to a job five days a week because you're locked in. That's why it's a parasite. It, it locks on to you and it essentially saps your dream. It saps any options you have in the future. So that is when debt can be evil. I don't think debt is evil, good or bad. It's when it is used improperly. Um, I have debt. I'm, you know, I'm mostly debt free, but I do have debt, but it's good debt as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and it doesn't trap me into any particular lifestyle or any particular uh, bad situation that I don't want. So, so many people have debt that keeps them in a bad situation. And, it, and when you want to be miserable, take away your choices. And you said, you're, you're chasing time, you're not chasing wealth. Well, time is wealth. Um, and, I, and the kind of time, uh, youthful time is more valuable than older time. Uh, you know, if, if you want to learn how to ski, you're going to have a hard time doing that at 65 years old when you're, uh, retire, when you're trying to retire as opposed to 30 years old. So time is wealth. And, and I think there's a big distinction there people need to understand is that trading away 30 years of your youthful time so you can be wealthy later in life is just a bad, it's a bad strategy. Yeah. Warren Buffett also says, don't save up sex for old age. Like it's a... <laughs> I've never heard that one. Yeah, yeah, he talks about that a lot. It's actually funny. Before we jump into the other book, which is unscripted, I just want to finish off and talk about sort of failure. You talk about in the book, failure is the sweat of success. You can't build your cardiovascular strength without working hard and sweating, and you can't experience success without failure. I think apart from being trapped in debt, a lot of people that live in the slow lane are actually scared by taking a risk and, and having those micro failures or, or, or losing everything as well. Can you talk about some of your experiences with sort of early failure and how they led to your later success? Sure. Well, every, every failure I had increased my capacity to learn different things. Um, you know, I was learning to code. That helped me very early on in life. Um, I don't do much of that anymore, but it helped me very uh, early then. Um, sales processes, how to attract customers, how to talk to investors. A um, lot of my failures uh, in the early days were based upon what I would call, I was, I was following my passion. And I'm very critical of this. This is a very popular platitude nowadays of, you need to follow your passion. And I think that's the worst business advice you can give somebody. Because when you follow your passion, you're entering into a crowded market. You're jeopardizing your passion. Um, and you're not being market focused. If you want to sell something, you have to be market focused. You have to give what your audience wants. You have to give what a market wants and demands. So for me, my early failures were all predicated on passions that I was following. I started a jewelry business. That failed. 
Well, it failed because no one wanted what I was selling, but I was passionate about it. And believe me, the passion fades really quickly when you can't pay the damn bills and you spend $2,000 on advertising and not one damn person buys what you're offering. Then I moved on to a supplement business. I was doing nothing special. I was fanatical about lift, lifting weights and fitness. So I'm going to sell some fitness supplements. Well, the fitness supplements didn't really do anything different than any other supplements were out there. I wasn't marketing any different. And guess what? I had the same result. The thing changed is when I actually looked at the market, I had someone at the time say, hey, uh, I need this in, uh, I need, a, I need a, uh, a car in New York. Do you know anybody? And I said, no, I don't. But that's when I discovered, hey, there's a need there that someone needs a car in New York and they live in Chicago. That changed everything because I was no longer interested in following passion. I was interested in solving problems and solving needs and doing things better. Um, good example is my brother-in-law uh, followed his passion and he owns a little uh, breakfast restaurant. And I hear the stories that he has to endure. The guy, he, he works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even when he has the days off, days off his employees are bothering him. Um, so the best case scenario he has in his business is he gets to pay his bills. That's it. And, 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 and based on what I've heard, he hates, he hates it now. So he followed a passion and now he hates it. Uh, so all my failures were predicated on that. So once you start attacking the market based on what it needs and wants, and you succeed at doing that, you're going to feel that passion. You're going to be very excited. Like I can tell you, someone, if they, if they message you and say, hey, Michael, man, I loved your podcast. It was great. Uh, you're going to feel passion. You're like, hey, I'm making a difference. This is great. Uh, so that realignment really um, shifted a lot of things for me. And um, was it one of those, again, one of those aha moments for me? Yeah, thanks for sharing. And it's, it's nice to hear some, you know, some of your failures and people look at successful people and think they've always just had success, but it is just a stepping stone in every failure you learn and, and you pivot. The best thing about life is, I had this analogy yesterday by speaking to someone, we're living in a live chessboard, we're living in a game and we are the chess piece. And what happens is, a lot of people just get stuck on this square and they never move, they never jump. They might move one foot out of the square, but they're never pivoting. They're never moving uh, through their board. They're literally stuck with the other pieces. You got to move. You got to. You got to go forward. You got to go left. To you got to go left sometimes to go uh, right. You've got to go back a couple of steps to go forward too. Yeah, we're, we're in a live game in a live chess piece. But yeah, let's move on. I just want to summarize some of the five commandments that I got from the book from Millionaire Fastlane, which is don't invest in businesses that don't address needs, which you just spoke about don't trade time for money don't operate on a small scale don't relinquish control and don't let the startup be an event instead of a process is there anything you want to unpack on that before we jump into unscripted uh, sure uh that's the sense framework you just described see control you don't want any one person one company one person saying i don't like what you're doing boom, you're out of business uh, that happens a lot with people they they focus, put all their eggs into one basket and Soon as, and then the next thing you know, someone changes something and they're out of business. There was a um, startup uh, called Little Things. They, they had like $75 million in revenue, but they were entirely focused on Facebook. Their whole model was based on the Facebook algorithm and Facebook changed something one day and six months later, they were out of business. That's when you violate control. You don't, that's like a job. Your, your employer says, you're, we, we fire you. We're going to sack you. You're out of a job. Well, that's the same thing in business. If you violate control and Amazon pulls the plug on your business and boom, you went from a million dollars a year to nothing. That's violating control, entry. You're solving a problem. You're creating value skew. That usually has to happen over a couple weeks to a couple months. If you just sign some paper and you're in business, you don't have a business. You're just joining a cattle call. Uh, need, we kind of discussed on that. My other books talk about value skew, very important for need. Scale, that is, you, hey, fast forward to a day you do $10,000 a month. What does that look like? Is it even possible? If you own a coffee shop, there's no way you're going to have 10,000 customers in one day. It will never happen. So that's scale. You got to make sure that whatever you're offering can be scaled. And what does that look like? And then, of course, uh, time which is, we talked about that, that's a specialized unit, make sure you're creating that business system. 
So that's the sense framework in a nutshell. And it's in covered in all my books. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, again, thank you for unpacking that. And it just makes so much sense as well. So yeah, going into the other book, sort of a brief introduction to that. You talk about slavery still exists, except today's contemporary slavery. It's called the script, an implied social contract, whereas a gilded cage is exchanged for voluntary indebtedness and a lifelong toil, a price sacrificed by a non-redeemable 50 years of Monday through Friday, an invisible servitude in which freedom is only promised by the arrival of life's fading twilight. Unscripted is your blueprint into awakening of abundance, freedom, and happiness, a keystone to unleashing a life few dream of. What's the book about and why is it different than the sort of Millionaire Fastlane? Millionaire Fastlane is primarily business. Unscripted is more of um, a business and life philosophy, how to unpack that uh, into the into your life. Because as I mentioned earlier, that this this is not a career, this is a lifestyle. And unscripted is about unpacking how culture and society, they all want you to follow a pre-desi- pre-designed script, a template for living. And quite frankly, people are catching on that this template no longer works. Um, you know, here in America, socialism is a very popular talking point with young people because they're finally understanding that the template that culture and government and education and society is giving them is flawed and there's something wrong with it. And instead of observing that, um, you know, hey, there's, there's a way out of that, there's a way you can defeat that, there's a way you don't have to be a part of that, they, you know, they go off and, well, I, I want to be a socialist instead. So it's kind of the wrong response to the right observation. Um, so unscripted is more of a life philosophy. It actually goes into a lot more depth um, into the fast lane philosophy, finding ideas, finding uh, business ideas, how to execute those ideas, even as a little um, financial uh, investment uh, strategy as well. In the back, if you ever get to the point where, hey, you know what? I never need to work another day in your life and here's how you can do that. Unscripted, you published that in 2017. And I'll just give the listeners, yeah, and you you go into more of the psychology behind it as well. A couple of notes I got from it. The rich get richer because the rich aren't bound by the script. They're the ones profiting from it. You also talk about the model citizenship. Now that that stands for, you're unwilling to become a scripted servant who is M is mediocre. O is for obedient, dependent, entertained, and lifeless. And who then becomes a cedar, a compromised party propagating the scripted OS. What are the cedars? Who are the cedars, our life suckers? Who are these six cedars you talk about? Do you want me to go through it or do you know them on top of your head? Top of my head, I wouldn't be able to name them all, but I, I can tell you it's a government, it's your educators, it's colleges. It's the media. It's everyone who is promoting a particular lifestyle. And that's the way you win at life. This is how you win at life. You go get that job. You save all your money. You become this avid investor. And you just don't buy, you know, the old saying, it's not an old saying anymore, but you're going to own nothing and you're going to be happy. That's the new thing today that they're pushing. That's part of the agenda. And all those things, all those institutions are working and coordinating to create a model citizen life where this is, this is how it is done. And I'm telling people, this is not how it's done. If you want to live a life beyond mediocre. Most of life is inverted and the people that are inverting things like that, just slogan, you said, you'll own nothing can be happy. Really the people promoting that will own everything and be happy and you will own nothing and be unhappy. So the the opposite is true. Um, yeah, just to recap the, the six cedars, yeah, friends and family, education, corporate cedars, the financial cedars, government and media as well. You go into the book and talk about hyper reality, which is your illusionary captors. I'll just name a couple of hyper realities that you talk about. You talk about name days, consumerism, college degree, hyper personality, virtual reality, entertainment, money, freedom, corporations. What what do you, what do you mean when you say hyper reality? A hyper reality is something you perceive as real, but it's not real. It's just a construct. It's a human construct. And once you once you observe those hyper realities, and then you see everyone just blindly uh, uh, blindly abiding by those hyper realities, it's kind of like the red pill in the in the matrix. 
And name days is a great example. Uh, Monday through Friday is a human construct. Aliens, if they visited Earth, would never understand. I mean, they would understand it, but there's nothing celestial about Monday through Friday. Humans, culture, and society has made Monday through Friday as a construct. And the default construct, of course, is Monday is when you start work and Friday is when you end work. And the weekend is just for you. That's a terrible trade. Five days for two. And if someone gave you an investment and said, hey, uh, give us $500, at the end of the week, we're going to give you $200, you would laugh them out of the building. You would say, hell no. But we do this with our time, with no questions asked. Yes, when you start a business, you're going you're gonna to invest a lot of time. But the objective is to get away from that five for two. And name days is a hyper reality that promotes that construct as normal and as unquestionable. Yeah, it all comes back to, I think, even the school and work, you know, your parents go to work, so you have to go to school Monday to Friday. And then that just repeats in that cycle, you go from school Monday to Friday to work Monday to Friday. Once you go to work, you get married, have kids, they go to school and it's just this loop of school and work and, and the rat race through there. Yeah, moving forward, you, you talk, oh, I love how you put this, you talk about the fuck you unscripted lifestyle, which is about pure, unadulterated life and liberty, and it uh, means owning your time and thoughts while curating your existence. It's not just to be, but to become. The fuck you of liberty has five primary freedoms, and I'll just read them out. Freedom from work, freedom from scarcity and financial constraint, freedom from hyper-realistic influences, freedom from hope and dependence, and freedom from from the ordinary talk about fuck this before fuck you you talk about fuck this is is an event is a traumatic epiphany and painful experience can you talk about that i like how you, you use those words it really drives the point home sure um the ft the fte or the fuck this event pardon my language um unscripted is a little uh a little uh vulgar <laughs> um yeah, it's, it's pretty raw. Um, FTE stands for a fuck this event. And that's when you just say, I can't take this any longer. Um, and it's, it's the point at which you say, you know, the pain of this life is far more worse than the pain I'm going to have to endure to escape it. Um, and a lot of people need to come to that point uh, before they make any change. Um, so there's, you know, on my forum, there's a lot of people that, talk about their their particular FTE. It happened uh, during COVID. A lot of people had FTEs during COVID. When they're chumming along and they're, and they're following the script, they're doing what culture wants, and boom, the next thing you know, they're out of a job. And uh, the government, you know, locked things down or whatever. And that was their event that say, you know what, I, I, I want to be more in control of my life and my existence. So an FTE is just the point of no return, we say, you know what, I'm going to make this happen. And I don't care if I make it happen in a year, two years, five years, because I'm, I refuse to live like this. So it's usually traumatic. Um, unfortunately, sometimes an FTE can be health related, or you don't get to see your kids, but one day a week, and, and they're growing uh, outside of your purview. It's just, there's so many things that are different for some people. But um, without that, a lot of people find change to be hard because there's nothing grinding at them and they're just living a mediocre, somewhat uh, comfortable life that does not imbue any kind of change. Yeah, well, if you can keep someone sort of fed, clothed, house, roofed, entertained, they will continue that existence and until and, and they die. We, we, we need these events to sometimes shake us to our core and to wake us up and realize that it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I like how you talk about the sort of the three types of unscripted entrepreneurs, each graduate to the next and uh, should aspire to move them all. So they're the unplugged unscripty. Then you talk about from that, you go into the fast lane unscripty and then the liberated unscripty and then the unscripted 1% as well. Is there anything you want to add on that with that progression of starting from that moment of, you know, fuck this to how do I become in that 1% of being unscripted? Uh, un unplugged is, is when you re you see the script, you observe it, you, you, it's, it's, you, you have the red pill and you aim to uh, escape the script. 
doesn't mean you're rich or anything like that. It's just, it's step one. It is taking that red pill. A fast lane on Scripty actually has started a business. They are starting to generate passive uh, income. They are starting to free up their time. They're starting to control their lives. And a liberated on Scripty is um, when you no longer have to work ever again. And you can pursue more passionate ventures that may not have economic viability. A great example, some of the greatest entrepreneurs are liberated on scriptees. Elon Musk is pursuing rockets and stuff. That's not a very economically viable venture. But because he is liberated, worth billions of dollars, he can pursue these radical things because he is liberated from financial constraint. For me, that was... Uh, owning a publishing company and being able to write things without a publishing company telling me you can't write about that. You can't say that. You can't do this. Well, this is too broad based. For me, that was that's what it was. And liberated, becoming a liberated unscripted is ultimately all our objectives. So we can, you know, just make life our oyster, our oyster and do whatever we want, buy whatever we want and just wake up and live how we want. Um, it's just, uh, it's very hard to describe until you get there. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the, the last thing I'll sort of want to cap up, sort of recap the whole conversation. And you talk about it in the book, the five levers of joy, and you've got this thing called the happy switch. Now to the happy switch, we're in obviously present moment, present moment awareness. And we're always in the now. And you talk about the five levers of joy, which is gratitude, relationships, autonomy, purpose and health so that's just a recap of getting to that stages where you can pull those five levers of joy down to your happy switch and that's what we're all going for it's living it's moving from a life of scriptedness and indebtedness and, and servitude to a life of unscripted and then you know just just living in your health living living on purpose living autonomy you know being with the relationships and the people friends and family that you want and then having gratitude for for that existence as well anything you want to expand on that before we sort of wrap up the uh the podcast does that sort of make sense sure all the decisions all the decisions we make in life are ultimately generated because we want to be happy um and happiness is more a mental state of mind than it is a external thing but there are things in the external that could influence your level of happiness one of those is autonomy which is why owning a business is so great for happiness because you are in control of it. And they have actually done research on this that proves autonomy is 50% responsible for your happiness quotient. So if you have a job and you have some autonomy in that job, uh, you're probably going to be pretty happy. Um, but in a business, you also have autonomy if you structure it properly. Uh, going back to my brother-in-law who owns that restaurant, he doesn't have autonomy. Um, the restaurant owns him. He doesn't own the restaurant. So autonomy is a big one. Gratitude. Um, we live in a very comfortable society. We have unlimited food. You walk into a store, there's just shelves and shelves of food. So gratitude is one of them. Obviously, your family having good relationships. And of course, your health. Without health, you know, money doesn't matter, uh, you know. So ultimately, all those things come into play if you want to focus on happiness um, and, and, and have an advantage. Um, and because you, you don't have to be wealthy to be happy. Uh, you just have to be mindful of what the things are that will influence that that state. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to cap off, a lot of people think they have to start this massive business, but you can just start with a lifestyle business. So a business that, that meets your lifestyle needs and whatever that may be, if it's $10,000 a month, $20,000 a month, even $5,000 a month, you know, but if you're working, you know, autonomously in your own little business, it's improving your health purpose, uh, relationships and gratitude. Well, we'll go for that. I mean, start, start small. You have to start uh, somewhere, but uh, MJ, thank you very much for, um, for writing these books and living the life you've done and and yeah being a sort of one of those speakers out there that's not the get rich slow guy but just basically being real and raw as well is there any new books that you're working on or any other material that's going to come out from yourself that you're working on or i'm working on a uh, mobile mobile um, goal setting system um in the great rat race escape which is my latest book i discussed the one five ten planacy which is a way to reverse engineer your dreams and uh, I'm creating a, a, an application to help people 
uh, unearth that and do that because a lot of people have goals, but they don't know how to engineer them from the future. And this app kind of is going to put all that together. Um, and if someone's curious about that, it is in the book um, explained uh, if you want to do it on your own without an app or anything like that. But that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, there'll be a book, a companion book for that as well. Um, to detail that process if anyone doesn't want to bother with an online app. Because I, I personally, I, I use these. This is, the, this is the system. But I know a lot of people don't like use paper. I'm old school. But uh, I've had a lot of people ask about that system to be, um, be something online. Uh, that's what I'm working on. Uh, if people want to reach me, I can be reached at thefastlaneforum.com. I'm there every single day. I contribute every single day. Um, you can just stop by, say hello, and I'm likely going to respond back and say hello back to you. Yeah, when that app comes out, let me know and I'll share it with my audience. I've got uh, a big list through there. So, yeah, the Escape the Rat Race uh, system and the goal setting reverse engineering sounds good. Well, MJ, thank you for being a great guest on the uh, Best Book Bits podcast, and we appreciate your knowledge and uh, all that you've done. So, uh, have a great day. And, yeah, again, thank you for being on the show. You bet. Appreciate it. Appreciate the invite.